And now, as promised, here is the list of the top five premiers as judged by a panel of 30 experts over the past 40 years in Canada. And here we go from the bottom up. Number five, Robert Bourassa, the Liberal Premier of Quebec from 1970 to 76, and then again from 85 to 94. In fourth place, Frank McKenna, Liberal Premier of New Brunswick from 1987 to 97. He served 10 years to the day. In third place, Alan Blakeney, New Democrat Premier of Saskatchewan from 1971 to 82. In second place, William Davis, Progressive Conservative Premier of Ontario from 1971 to 85. And topping the list of Canada's best premiers of the last 40 years, Peter Lougheed, Progressive Conservative from Alberta from 1971 to 85. And Peter Lougheed joins us now on the line from Calgary, Alberta. And Mr. Lougheed, in welcoming you to the program, I guess I should just ask off the top, what's it like to be number one? Well, I was just thrilled with it, and I wasn't expecting it. I was just uh, thrilled and pleased, uh, and particularly because I know the other people, most of them, very well, and I've always had such high regard and high respect for the other people that are, that are involved, and particularly the ones you just mentioned. You do know all the people on the list, which makes this next question, I, th I hope, particularly interesting. Is there something that you would point to, a quality or a characteristic, that all five of you had in common that warrants your being on that list? Yes, there is, and it would probably surprise you, Steve, but the attribute that really pays off is listening ability. Huh. The ability to listen. Both listen to the people that are involved with you in this working in your office of the Premier. Uh, listening to the media, yes. <laughs> that came in second, you noted, Steve. <laughs> uh, listening uh, to your party and to the general public. All of those are the factors that were really crucial, I think, uh, for pe premiers, and I think are still, of course, today. I'm inferring from your answer that you think politicians today too mu do too much talking and not enough listening. <laughs> well, it's a struggle because, you know, you, people in your field are always asking us questions, <laughs> and uh, we should be doing some listening. I, I always think after I've had a program, Steve, that it's very important for me to think back, now what questions did he ask me that were surprised me? And I think... Uh, that's part of the listening process. Gotcha. Everybody on that list except Frank McKenna basically governed around the same time. What was yes. it about that time in Canadian history that you think produced so many good premiers? Well, I think the two very major issues were involved. The Constitution was a key one. Uh, we worked with Mr. Trudeau on the Constitution and, uh, and uh, the whole question of the development of the Constitution and having a Canadian Constitution was a major, major factor. We also had at that time, uh, in terms of federal-provincial relations, the whole question of the financing of the provinces uh, uh, working with the federal government. So there were two very major issues during that era that had to be dealt with on a first minister's basis with Mr. Trudeau in the chair. Hmm. You are talking right now on a television network that was created by your old pal William Davis, so I can't help but That's ask right. a question about him. You two were great political rivals, of course, back in the day. You governed, you were both progressive conservative premiers. You both governed from 1971 to 85. You both won four elections. You both thought about running for the national leadership of the Conservative Party. And I wonder whether you intend to give him a phone call at some point and tease him about the fact that you came first. Well, I won't do that. I've just, uh, it hasn't been too long since we had a good visit. Uh, but, you know, Bill and I have maintained our friendship over the years. In fact, one of the amusing stories, and I think it's appropriate for this program, is that uh, uh, we were both football fanatics, and often these meetings would be held in, at the Governor General's residence in, in Ottawa, and uh, the, they knew the situation between us because there were uh, strong differences of opinion. And this has been public before, but I'll repeat it now. And that is that uh, we would stand up and excuse ourselves with the Governor General and walk out of this Monday uh, dinner and uh, go across the street and watch uh, uh, Monday Night Football. <laughs> Did the Governor General know that? He, we told him later. <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your chops on football, both of you actually go way back. He played for the UT Varsity Blues, but I think, I think you played for the Edmonton Eskimos at one point, didn't you? That's right. So we had a really, it was a, uh, one of the things that, we had differences of view, as you know, uh, but we had things where we were uh, commonality and we were friends, and I use that example just to show that uh, what the nature of First Minister's relationships are in working together with people, even if you have different views. 
Gotcha. I want to ask you about uh, the province of Alberta from 1971 when you first started governing, when the population was about a million six, compared to today where it's 3.8 million. Does the province today <laughs> seem dramatically different from the one you led? Different because of the size of it. I think uh, different because of the complexity of some of the current issues. And I, wor I work with Alison Redford, the new premier, on that. Uh, different in terms of so many new people have come to the province, both from other parts of Canada and from other parts of the world. And so the larger population adds to the complexity of the issues. But it's still very interesting to me that there's quite a commonality of attitude uh, that persists. And I think that was reflected in the recent election results and the incredible victory of the Progressive Conservative Party in Alberta. I am going to come back to that later, but I still want to ask you more about your province, and, and namely this. Uh, my recollection is you tried awfully hard to build a very diversified economy in Alberta, and I wonder whether you worry that today the economy there is still too tightly focused on natural resources. That's a very good question, Steve. Uh, we made progress, quite a bit of progress. Uh, particularly, we, we brought in things such as the Medical Research Foundation, and we brought in a number of things with regard to building up our universities and our post-secondary system that has helped. Uh, we have a diversity of uh, the small business that's worked very well, but still, despite all these efforts, uh, and uh, be, the circumstances are that the natural resources, the oil and the natural gas, it still plays a very dominant part in the economy of Alberta. Alberta is, of course, the powerhouse province in Canada right now, and I'm not sure that it has always wanted to play, and, and uh, certainly those who advocated for the firewall Alberta theory of how to do things didn't always advocate for taking a major national role in running the country's affairs. Do you think Alberta today wants to seriously be the big brother of confederation? Well, I don't like the word big brother, but uh, I don't agree with the concept behind or the fundamental basis of your question, because we have always taken a leadership role uh, in Alberta even though we weren't the strongest province or the biggest province. And we've we took that under the Constitution. We took that in, in terms of the uh, development of the amending formula in the Constitution. We played a major role, too, in federal provincial financing with the federal government. So we've always tried to take, even though we we're only about 10, 11 percent of the total population of Canada, we've tried to play a, a major role in terms of uh, uh, federal provincial issues. And I think uh, in an important ways, as I've just mentioned, we've succeeded. Well, let me get your view on how Albertans, whether or not there's been any change in attitude and how they see the federal government. Of course, when you were the uh, Premier of Alberta, the Prime Minister was A, a Liberal, <laughs> B, a Quebecer, <laughs> and C, brought in the National Energy Program, which was not a big hit in Alberta, if I recall properly. Today, the right. Prime Minister is an Albertan. Uh, he is a Conservative, and uh, the NEP is not on its way back. So do Albertans have a less hostile view towards the federal government today, in your view? Yes, they do, and I think that's because of the issues. Uh, uh, we obviously, as I mentioned earlier, we, Mr. Trudeau and I tangled very much uh, in terms of issues like the Constitution and on federal provincial financing and other issues which happened. It's part of the uh, Canadian constitutional process. Uh, I think today, uh, uh, probably with Mr. Harper, uh, there's uh, less of that, and he's got a strong majority. So it has changed. I think there's less hostility. Uh, I shouldn't use the word hostility because Mr. Trudeau and I got along well personally, even though we had some very major differences. But it isn't quite as dramatic. Uh, the one thing that's missing for Canadians is I don't think they've had recently anyway uh, the advantage of seeing the first ministers in action, which you will remember, Steve, mm -hmm. when we would hold those federal provincial conferences. Uh, in full, uh, t full light of television. Yes, indeed. I, I want to play you a little tape right now because you did reference the constitutional negotiations that you were involved in 30 years ago. <laughs> and in this studio last week, we had Jean Chrétien, Roy McMurtry, and Roy Romano. And we talked about that night, the night where the agreement came together and where at the end of the day, uh, Quebec found itself isolated. I want to play some tape of my conversation with Jean Chrétien and then I'll come back with a question. Roll tape, please. So you know, you all three know, that this night has gone down in Quebec history as the night of the Long Knives, the night of Quebec's humiliation, the night when Quebec was isolated and forgotten about by all the rest of Canada. 
How accurate is that portrayal in your view? <laughs> you know, for me, you know, it was an agreement. There will never be enough for them. They didn't want to sign. And they could not sign. Because suppose that Levesque signed a new Canadian constitution. Can he get up the morning after and he says, I don't want to stay in this country anymore, despite of the fact that I am responsible for the new constitution that meets the demands of Quebec? Mr. Lougheed, 30 years later, any regrets or hesitation about not getting Quebec to sign on? Well, there's two parts to that uh, question. The first part is the accuracy of Mr. Chrétien's remarks. And I have to be blunt about it. They are not accurate. The decision was made at the breakfast the next morning of whether or not uh, we would try to move ahead uh, with the Constitution with eight of the provinces, and Mr. Levec decided to not be part of that. So the seven of us took it to the conference room to the, and, made, and moved ahead with it. It was led by Premier Peckford, but we were all on side of it. And, and Premier Davis came in, and he played in a very important role in terms of uh, putting it together. And uh, it's very, very fascinating how that turned out. And that was uh, uh, the part of it. I don't know why we have this continual emphasis on, uh, on Mr. Uh, Kretjohn, uh, on what he was doing, because that didn't happen. That wasn't the ultimate part of the Constitution. So there you have a, a very significant difference in view of what happened at the time of the Constitution from me, and I'm sure I could get the, the endorsation of a, a number of the other premiers that were involved too. Well, in fact, Roy Romano did say there was no agreement until Peter Lougheed said so the next morning. So you got that on record. I did. We got that on record. We had to work hard to do it, but we got Roy Romano on record on that. <laughs> Tell me this. I want to, uh, in our last couple of minutes here, uh, talk about the you know, massively historic election that just took place in the province of Alberta. And I wonder whether or not you know, you started a dynasty, and it's still going. Quite incredibly, it's still going, and it's going to be the longest political dynasty in Canadian history by the time Alison Redford finishes this term, as we assume she will. How much time do you spend worrying that the dynasty that you helped start is going to go the way of the previous Alberta dynasties? Well, Steve, that's a very important question because there were periods involved. Uh, after I left government, uh, I was succeeded by Don Getty, who basically followed with the same thinking. But then we were involved in the Ralph Klein era, and it was very different and uh, very much uh, internal uh, to Alberta. Uh, I, I feel now, with Alison Redford, very, very pleased, and I have visited and talked with her. I think she's going to return to what were the fundamentals of the progressive conservative government and return to a, a government that's moving outward and uh, moving in a pan-Canadian way. I feel very positive about that, and I think it'll be very positive for Canada as well. How much do you fear that the Wild Rose next time round uh, will be a much more formidable force to deal with? I, I don't feel it very, very much because they're isolated down in southern Alberta primarily. Uh, they're in the very area that social credit uh, was left with when we were defeated them in 1971, and then we took those seats back in 75. But they're in an isolated geographic area primarily. And it'll be very hard. They have a good leader in Danielle Smith, but it'll be very hard to move out of that because I feel confident that the progressive conservatives will run a very effective government. And just finally, Mr. Lougheed, I think if my math is right, you're 83 years old right now. How are you doing? That's right. I'm doing fine. The, the football guy has got the knees, <laughs> and that, you know, as I, you remember, I played for the Evan Eskimos and ran back punts. Well, the football have got to the knees, so I. Uh, I uh, struggle a little bit getting into this chair, but I'm still okay and still active, as you can tell. We are very glad to hear that and also very grateful for your spending so much time with us tonight here on TVO. Congratulations on being number one, and thanks for your time tonight. Thanks, Steve. Good wishes to you and your colleagues. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.